In this video, we'd like to prove the following theorem about integrals, path integrals that are independent of path. This one says, let f, the integral, path integral along some curve c, f dot dr, be independent of path on or in an open domain d and r2. So open here means that this, this domain does not contain a boundary, does not have a boundary. Um, and the fact that it's in r2 is just going to be helpful for us to write this proof. Um, actually, you can extend this r2 you can extend this to Rn, okay? Um, the conclusion of this theorem is that F is conservative on this domain D, all right? And remember that a conservative vector field is one for which there is a potential function. So this vector field F is gonna equal the gradient of some function F on our domain D. And so, um, by the way, if we start with a conservative vector field, then we know that it's independent of path. So you could re reframe this theorem as an if and only if, and in the notes I actually do that. But for the sake of this lecture video, um, we're just going to prove one direction here. Um, the direction where you assume that f is conservative is very straightforward. In this direction, where we want to prove that f is conservative, given, given the fact that the path integral is independent of path, our job, or our goal, is to construct the potential function little f. So we want to construct the potential function little f. And um, the way that we're going to do it is, is a little interesting, but we're going to do it by basically writing down a formula that you know we might suspect is true, and then going back and proving that the formula is actually is correct. And I'm going to prove this for one component function and leave the other one as, a, um, as an exercise. But let's get started then. So here's our proof. So the proof I'm going to write out in steps here, and I'll probably write down all of the claims that I've proved, but um, it, it, this one's a little involved, and really what we want to do is make sure that we understand the geometry here. So here's the idea. The, our vector field F is supposed to be conservative on the entire domain D, so our first job is going to pick, going to be to pick any point in D. So let's let A and D be any point, but once we pick this point, we are going to fix this point, okay? So with this in, in later math classes, you'll call this an arbitrary, a fixed but arbitrary point. So arbitrary but fixed. Usually fixed but arbitrary is the way you would say this, but arbitrary but fixed. Um, so let's draw a picture over here as we go along. So I'm going to draw our domain D with a thin boundary, just so that we remember that the boundary is actually not included in D. That that's the open, right? So the boundary is not included. And then our point A, I'm going to pick point A to just be here. Okay, so A is just any point in, the, in this domain. Now what we want to do is write down a formula for the potential function. So, and remember there are many potential functions for every vector field, so for every conservative vector field. So here's what I'm going to claim. A potential function for the vector field capital F is given by this formula, little f of x, y is equal to the path integral, which goes along any path from a to the point x, y, uh, f dot dr. All right, so this right here, this is, this is my, this is what I'm claiming is going to be our potential function. All right, but the idea here that we maybe requires a little more a little more um, conversation is that this notation right here is supposed to represent a path integral along any path and we're allowed to do this because we know that our, our path integrals are independent of path in D so along any path C in D again the idea here is that if we choose say we want to integrate our uh, we want to find, sorry, the value of our potential function little f at this point, which I'll call x, okay, but its coordinates are x comma y. Uh, I might just, out of pure laziness, uh, write this point as x bar in the future. Then, according to our definition, we can evaluate our function f here, our, poten our potential, potential function, hope, hopeful potential function, at this point x by finding any path here in D, okay, any path in D that starts at A and ends at X. 
Okay, and whatever the value of the path integral is along this path, that's what we're going to say the value of f of xy is, or f of x bar. Okay, so there's a definition of a function. It's definitely a function, for sure. What we want to do now is prove that this is truly a potential function for our vector field f. So that's, that's what remains to be proved. All right, so sometimes in math we, we write RTP, remains to prove. And so what we want to do is then show that the gradient of f is equal to big F, right? That's what it means to be a potential function. Um, what I'm going to do is provide an argument that shows that the partial derivative in the x direction is equal to the x component of our of our vector field. So I'm going to call that P of x, y, all right? Where, of course, our vector field F is going to be represented in this two-dimensional domain by p of x, y, comma, q of x, y. And if it's in three dimensions or more dimensions, then p is still going to represent the x component function, but it will depend on more, more variables, obviously, right? So again, this is what remains to prove, but this is what I'm going to prove. And then hopefully once we've done, it, done uh, the x direction or the x partial derivative, the rest of it will be pretty clear as to how you proceed. It'll still require some work, but how you proceed should be clear. All right, so let's do it. So, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to take advantage of the fact that our domain is uh, open. And here's what we can do. So around any point, remember this x is kind of a variable, right? But around any point x in our domain d, uh, since d is open, now this is kind of a, a technical argument um, that you may not have seen before at this level of math, so in Calculus 3, but the idea is that if your domain is open and the boundary is not included, then there's always a way, so we can always find, in this case, a disk centered at this point. All right, so let me try to make that disk look a little bit better, but a disk centered at our point here. Um, that's not very centered, is it? So. Try number three, a disk centered at our point, all right, for which the disk is entirely inside of D. So this little disk here, we'll call this D sub X bar. This disk is entirely inside of the domain D. This D right here for our disk represents the disk of, of radius, X, uh, sorry, centered at X bar. Um, and it's, it's entirely contained in D. Now, if this region was not open, then it's not necessarily possible to do this because our point x bar could live on the boundary, right? But since we've, since we've said that our, our domain D does not contain a boundary, then there's no way for the point x bar to be on the boundary. Um, as we get close to where the boundary would be, we might have to take our disk, this uh, magenta disk, to be much smaller, but we could still find a disk, okay? And so that's the first step. So around any point x bar and D, uh, since D is open, let me finish writing this out, then uh, we can find a small, potentially, small disk, which we called in the picture dx bar, centered at x bar, that lies entirely in D. Okay, and so again, this is a property of our domain being open. This is why we need the open domain uh, for this for this portion of the theorem. All right, once we do that, now that we have our domain here, uh, we can choose now another point. Let's let's make this point light blue. Another point which has the same y value. So so this domain is sitting somewhere in the x y coordinate plane. We don't really care where, but the idea is that we can find a point that has the same y value as our point x, one, x bar that lives inside of this disk. So let's call this x bar with a 1. Okay, and so down here, let me write this down, but we can find a point inside of the disk, dx bar, which has the same y value, but a different x value. Okay, so then we can choose this point x1 inside of the disk dx, dx bar, right, such that the coordinates of x1, right, x1 has coordinates given by these following formula, so given by uh, x1 comma y. So it has the same y value as our point x bar, but it has a different x value, okay? 
And at this point, we can now construct, we can construct a curve, which at this point takes us from, um, I'll make this curve uh, blue, I guess, but we can now construct a curve which takes us from A somehow to X1, all right, we'll call this por portion of the curve C1. That gets us inside of the disk, right? Gets us inside of the disk. And then from inside the disk, we can then take this tiny portion, we can add on this tiny portion of the curve, we'll call it C2, that's just a horizontal line segment, which goes from X1 over to X bar. Okay, and so remember, we're allowed to take any path we want to get from A to X. So let's now take a path that first gets us to X1 and then gets us over to X. Okay, so since I drew the picture, I'm just going to write this down um, a little bit tersely, but then we can choose a path C, which is equal to C1 plus C2, such that, and I'll just write this now, C1 takes us from A to X1 bar, right, and then C2 takes us from X1 bar to X. So this is exactly as I've drawn in the picture. I'm just writing it out in words now. And then our integral now, our integral along C, right? So this is our curve C, um, f dot dr. This is equal to the integral along C1, f dot dr, plus the integral along C2, f dot dr. Okay, so we've got we've broken this down into two path integrals, and remember the integral itself, this integral along c of f dot dr. This is just the value of f of x y, or what we might call f of x bar. Okay, that's just the value of f of x bar, and so now that's equal to this. Okay, um, the next step is we want to now try to take the derivative of this thing, but let's and remember I'm focusing on the x partial derivative of this function, but let's think about what's happening here. The first portion of the curve, the curve C1, this takes us from the point A, so we didn't give A coordinates, but it takes us from the point A to the point x1 comma y. x1 is a fixed value, right? x1 is a fixed value of a fixed point. y um, is, the, is the portion that depends on our, our point x bar, but this portion then does not depend on x. All right, and then the second portion takes us from x1, y, up to x, comma, y, uh, f dot dr. Okay, and again, the key fact here is that this portion does not depend on x. It depends on x1, but x1 was fixed. We chose that and fixed that. That's a fixed point. Um, x bar uh, is is the point up here, the other point that we that we care about, right? So. Now we want to take the derivatives of this thing, right? Well, this is the key point. If we're going to take the x derivative of this entire term, number one, the x derivative will distribute over both of these parts, right? Uh, and number two, if this portion does not depend on x, then its x derivative is going to be zero, right? Its x derivative is going to be zero. So at this point, we now have the partial derivative of f with respect to x is the partial derivative of our path integral with respect to x, which we have just talked about, right, can be broken up into the partial derivative of this c1 portion, right, plus the partial derivative of the c2 portion. But based on our argument, this portion, I wrote it in green, so let's stick with green, this portion, the derivative is zero. Okay, the, the derivative of this portion does not, de this portion does not depend on x, so its derivative is zero. And so what we have then is that the x partial derivative of our function is just equal to the x partial derivative of the path integral, which takes us from uh, the point, let's, let's write the points in the boundary like we did up here, okay? So it takes us from the point x1, y to the point x, y, um, and that's of course of f dot dr. All right, and now the last thing to do is to remember that, well, it's not quite the last thing, but it's close. It's very, we're very close to the end here. So the, the next thing to do is to remember that we had up here chosen to write out the components of our function f, our vector field f, as p and q. And so that means that this integral, f dot dr, right, it can actually be dotted out, and we can write this then, 
as our partial derivative, df dx, is equal to the x partial derivative of, now the path integral still goes from x1, y to x, y. Notice the y is not changing there, right? We, we chose that. Um, of, now instead of this, we have p dx plus q dy, right? That's what it means when we dot this out, when we have components of these things. And of course, the x derivative of this thing that only depends on y is going to be zero. Okay, and what we're left with is just a portion of the integral here. So what we end up with is that this is just equal to the x partial derivative of the integral. So um, I, I didn't explain why this one is zero uh, quite as well. So let me break this up into two pieces and, and say a little bit more about that. But this is the integral from x1, y, x, y of p dx, that derivative, plus, let's leave this for a second. So I said this is going to be zero, but let's talk about why it's going to be zero. All right, and this is q dy. And so I said that it, this one um, doesn't depend on x. It's not true. This one does depend on x, right? But it doesn't really depend on y in reality. What's happening here is that the y is not changing. Right? We chose this portion of the curve, if we go way back up to our picture, to be horizontal or constant in the y direction. And if it's constant in the y direction, that means that the change in y, dy, is constant equal to zero. Right, And so it's actually because of the fact that we chose this tiny uh, portion, this tiny curve segment to be horizontal, that this dy is equal to zero. And anytime you integrate up a zero, that becomes zero. So that's why, that's the actual reason why this portion of the integral is equal to zero. And after all this work, what we finally have is that df dx is equal to partial derivative of this thing, uh, this, this integral, where this integral is just an integral with respect to x, right? Integral with respect to x. Um, and the integral itself uh, it only depends on x. The y's don't change in this one. And so this thing can be thought of as a fundamental theorem of calculus part one um, if we just rewrite this in terms of, say, a parameter. So we're almost there. df dx is now equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of, I'm going to swap out and make an integration variable here. So let's call it t. Um, so uh, the integral here with respect to t is going to say this. It's going to go, our integral is going to go from x1 to x, and the integrand is going to be p of t comma y dt. All right, and you can think about this. It's going to be exactly the same as what I've got written here. This is a partial integral over a portion of a two-dimensional curve, but the y is constant. Um, plug out, you, you, change out the variable to get an integration variable. And now this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. Of course, that tells us that this is just p of x, y, right? And so after all this kind of uh, re, uh, reimagining of things, we end up with the x partial derivative of our function that we built is equal to, indeed, the x coordinate function of our vector field. Okay, so that is half of the proof, but that's really the hard work because once we've done this all in the x direction, you can imagine how you're going to do this in the y direction, right? So what's left to show is that df dy is equal to the q component, and you're going to repeat this argument, okay? You're going to repeat this argument, except instead of choosing your point inside of the disk to be next to the, the given point in a horizontal sense, you're going to choose it to be in a vertical sense, okay? Either above or below, it doesn't matter. You're going to choose it to be in a vertical sense and repeat the whole argument just with respect to y instead of x, okay? So I'm going to write here, similarly, and this requires work from you, but similarly, df dy is equal to q of xy, all right? And therefore, indeed, we uh, have shown that the gradient of f is equal to big F, and therefore f, big F, is conservative, right? If we can find a potential function, then automatically our, our vector field is conservative. That's the definition of conservative.